course, I need to thank Olga for um, uh, initially suggesting that uh, I come to Sydney for a few weeks, uh, hang out, meet people, um, do some work. It turned out that we had a really lovely time uh, putting our minds together on our computers back to back and uh, working away at a, at a document um, that might, if we do things right, grow into something publishable. Uh, you know, don't want to jinx us, but fingers crossed it'll, it'll grow into something publishable. Uh, we've had a lovely time brainstorming, uh, running ideas by each other, um, imagining what a paper might look like, what a conference might look like, what a book might look like. Uh, but along the way, uh, she introduced me to some uh, really lovely people, many of whom are in this room, uh, and, uh, and I will always treasure my, my all too short time here at the University of Sydney. And as Lee said, um, I, didn't, you know, I would love to come back and, and I'm, I'm glad that she would like to have me back. And of course, I have to thank Lee and her staff with Shark for uh, making this possible. Uh, it's really a, a special place and a unique opportunity uh, to have this sort of connection and camaraderie uh, and, uh, and collaboration. Now this talk I'm giving to you today is a branch of this project that I'm working on with uh, Professor Boychek. The project, the larger project, is uh, both uh, theoretical and empirical in its analysis of the idea of digital sovereignty. And I will get to that notion of digital sovereignty once I take you through the story of Elon Musk. And then I'm going to tell you the story of why Elon Musk matters to this question of digital sovereignty. So we'll talk about Elon Musk, we'll talk about digital sovereignty and its countervailing force, digital hegemony, and then we'll talk about why and how Elon Musk matters or scrambles the notion of digital sovereignty. But of course, the other big issue is media ownership, which for decades has been a concern of scholars and critics and activists who are worried about the you know, certain anti-democratic or undemocratic tendencies in global media. His role, Elon Musk's role in our media ecosystem is unique. Uh, I think it's been under-examined in important ways, over-examined in trivial ways, and I'll explain why. So, um, and as I go through this, uh, I'm having to consult my notes off of my own screen because I'm not able, not able to see it here. So uh, slightly more awkward than I had hoped for this presentation. So Elon Musk is someone I make fun of constantly. If you follow me on Twitter, I am having a great time trolling Elon Musk every time he tweets something dumb, which is multiple times per day. I make fun of him, I think, fairly effectively. Uh, it's mostly for my own pleasure. I have no reason to think he's ever seen any of my responses to his tweets. Uh, but I act as if I'm in conversation with the guy, which is, I think, kind of funny in itself. Um, and, you know, so, look, I, I amuse myself with it. And he's a comical character in a lot of ways. But I'd like to put his comic persona, his absurdity to the side today a bit, while acknowledging that his absurdity is a reflection of his recklessness. He's basically an unthoughtful person. He's reckless, and therefore he's dangerous because he wields odd forms of power, forms of power we have very few models for, very few explanatory mechanisms for. And I can't think of many people or any people who have had this particular kind of power in the world at such a fraught time. Now, that's not to say that other major figures, wealthy people have not wielded uh, you know, uh, uh, untoward power. We've, we've seen this with uh, the Morgans and the Rockefellers uh, and uh, the Murdochs of the world in terms of their ability to wield political and sometimes even military power at a distance and have states behave and shape themselves uh, toward their wishes. We, so we have seen that before, but we haven't seen this kind of power. Now, uh, Today and for most of the past four years, Elon Musk has been counted as the wealthiest person in the world. 
Uh, his fortune has gone up and down with the value of Tesla stock. Most of his wealth is in Tesla stock. He is the majority owner of Tesla stock. And Tesla has been remarkably successful on the stock market, if not necessarily on the highway. He owns several other companies. This is not an exhaustive list of the companies he owns and controls. I'm not going to talk about the boring company because it's boring. Uh, it's a pun, which like, OK, whatever. You're naming your company after a pun, right? It, it, mostly the boring company is supposed to set up what he calls hyperlink, which is a tunnel through which a vehicle will travel at an excessive rate at some sort of high rate and move people. I think we've had those for more than a century and a half in many cities, including Paris, New York, and London, for, you know, uh, but he is calling it a hyperlink instead of a subway um, and, uh, or a metro. Uh, he has yet to actually do anything with this company. Uh, it's privately owned. He founded it, got some investors, talks a lot about it. Um, you can see it employs fewer than 200 people. I have no idea what any of them do. Neuralink, another one of his efforts now, and he's been sort of pumping it and trying to get uh, US government approval to implant chips in people's brains to monitor their neural activity, chart neural activity. I'm not sure what would happen with that neural activity. No one's really sure. I don't think Musk is really sure. But the company exists, again, fewer than 200 employees. Uh, there's an estimate of its value, uh, of its current valuation. It's not a real estimate. If you look at these uh, valuations for um, SpaceX, Boring, Neuralink, and Twitter, these are estimates by people in the finance world. They are not actual reflections of market capitalization because they are not traded on the open market. These are privately held companies. Of these, only Tesla is publicly traded on the markets. And so that 1.031 trillion valuation of Tesla, which is different today, from this slide is about three months old, uh, is, uh, is a real number, if such a thing can be taken as a real number. Do, do these numbers translate into power? In some cases. Sometimes his investment in these companies and his dependence on Tesla stock for everything he does translates into vulnerability as well. So his position in the world is one of both power and vulnerability. And I'll explain in a moment how that happens. Elon Musk built his empire on luck and bluster and government subsidies. Basically, those are the three elements. He got lucky. If you delve into the history of Tesla and why Tesla took off as it did when it did, you will find that he made a few really good decisions, dozens of terrible decisions, but the timing and the luck worked out just right for him. By the way, he did not found Tesla. Don't let anybody tell you that he founded Tesla or that he invented anything. He bought Tesla. He took the money he earned from selling his share of PayPal to eBay, at that time, I think he sold it for about $200 million. He took a significant share of that and became the majority investor and therefore chair of the board of a fledgling electric car company based in Southern California that was already producing an electric car that was fairly impressive. So the engineering, many of the engineering moves had already been made, the vision had already been established by the actual two founders of the company whom he pushed out pretty quickly once he became chair of the board, made himself CEO, then took the company public, and got all the credit for it. But he is not some engineering genius who came up with these ideas that made Tesla a viable electric car, and in many ways the model for a number of other cars that have come since. Nonetheless, he got really lucky and, and, and blustered his way through it, claimed credit, people believed him, put him on covers of magazines, generated more interest among investors, Tremendous trust among the venture capital world, which is different from the public investment market, right? The public investment market is 
fairly conservative and staid. They're looking for real value that you can see on balance sheets most of the time. I say that with some caveats. The venture capital world is all about placing bets. It's a huge casino. Uh, and uh, some of the people in the venture capital world, I think most of them have done fairly well. Uh, but it is a very different set of questions, right? So bluster matters, ego matters. It gets rewarded in that world in ways that it's not often rewarded in other parts of the world. Nonetheless, how we became the world's richest person is this combination of luck, bluster, and government subsidies. Every single one of these companies, except for Twitter, has basically inflated its books with checks from one government or another, chiefly the United States government. SpaceX, which is one of his most successful companies and the one I'm gonna spend the most time talking about today, exists almost entirely because of contracts with NASA in the United States. He has other contracts with private entities to send satellites up, private companies, some other governments, but most of his money comes from taxpayers like me. Tesla exists and has, at this point in time, a positive balance sheet. Rare, it's been a rare thing and took a long time to get there because of massive US government subsidies for electric cars. Not even talking about the massive government subsidies for the road system in the United States that makes such a company possible in the first place. Uh, so uh, Musk's libertarian orientation would resist this description, but it's absolutely true. So as I said, Tesla has rarely made a profit, uh, basically made a profit for the first time in 2020. In 2020 and 2021, Tesla was able to record a profit largely because during that time, just before it crashed, Musk sold a lot of Bitcoin that was owned by Tesla. So he cashed in on Bitcoin inflation and shifted the balance to show a profit. Now, that 2022 profit, which is modest, right? That 12.6 billion, that's fairly modest for a company capitalized like this. And given the revenue that it's generated, is real. Uh, between 2020 and 2022, Tesla was able to actually meet its targets for rolling out its Model 3, which is one of the few affordable cars that, um, that Musk has ever been able to produce. Not affordable to most of us, but affordable to enough people around the world that he was able to actually move some of his product at, at a rate that generated a profit. 2023 is likely to also be a profitable year for Tesla. Let's also be clear, it is likely to be a profitable year for almost every other automobile company. This is not exceptional. Tesla is actually exceptional among automobile companies for failing to make a profit all those other years. But profit has never really been important to Tesla. Tesla is about market penetration, about putting the emblem out there, mostly in the driveways of famous people and wealthy people to generate aspirational emotions and make you want a Tesla and make you want someday to be able to afford a Tesla. And, and the long-term goal is to have Teslas roll out with lower and lower price points over time as your income and wealth grows. And at some point those two curves would meet and you can afford a Tesla. And of course you've always wanted one because all these people you like and respect are driving Teslas. That's how it's supposed to work. We'll see if it works that way. Nonetheless, that's the way it's gone and again, luck, bluster, and government subsidies have made this happen. In the United States, which is the most lucrative automobile market, although not the largest automobile market in the world, uh, there's a rapid proliferation of government-funded electric charging stations since the Biden administration took over. The Biden administration and Musk's companies are deeply connected to each other, and that is not to be underestimated. Now, Twitter is a different story. Twitter is the biggest and funniest disaster in Elon Musk's story. Uh, Twitter's never done well. So uh, this chart basically shows you how badly Twitter has done over the years. 
It had a very modest and short period of profit. Uh, actually, those years have disappeared from this graph. That's about 2017, 18, and 19. Um, so basically, right after Donald Trump took office, uh, and he was driving a lot of uh, new adoptions to Twitter. It was, it was one of those moments of fairly short period of time when a lot of people who weren't otherwise inclined to be active on Twitter uh, decided to see what craziness was going on, uh, or as the comedian Mark Maron said, what is he going to say next, right? So a lot of people joined Twitter for that reason. A lot of people joined Twitter because they liked Trump and wanted to follow the madness. Uh, and so uh, advertisers responded to that growth in audience among Twitter and it, uh, in Twitter. And it wasn't a substantial growth in audience, by the way. Um, it was uh, just enough to give advertisers a lot of faith in the future of Twitter which they had never had before. Twitter had basically had, uh, had been flat in terms of its growth for, for about six or seven years and had never come up with an advertising system that appealed to advertisers enough to generate lots of new advertising clients. Uh, if you were uh, trying to figure out where to put your advertising dollar, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube were always better bets than Twitter. It remains the case. Uh, so Twitter has never been a valuable company. Twitter was basically for sale for almost a decade. Uh, Walt, the Walt Disney Company almost bought Twitter in 2013 uh, for significantly less than the $44 billion that Elon Musk paid. They wanted to pay $20 billion for it. They ran it by all of their accountants and lawyers and advisors and decided it was a bad deal. So they passed on a company that was not as much of a mess and seemed to have a better future even then than Musk did. Musk bought Twitter at a terrible time for Twitter, at a terrible time for Musk, and uh, it, he's done nothing right since. Every move he has made has alienated users and advertisers, uh, and uh, it's, it's basically been a disaster. But as I said, Twitter has never really been a factor in the world. Um, you know, despite a lot of noise. Uh, this is uh, sort of the current um, rank of uh, social media platforms globally. You can see that Facebook is at about 3 billion people. 3 billion people, let's remember that there are 8 billion humans on Earth and 3 billion of us are on Facebook regularly. I can't think of another phenomenon in human history like that. Let's also consider that, you know, more than a billion people in the People's Republic of China can't get on Facebook. And so that number takes the eligible number of people who are on Facebook down to 7 billion. So 3 billion out of 7 billion, we're creeping up on half of the people on Earth being on one platform. Uh, and that growth is not slowing. The areas in the world where Facebook is growing are the areas of the world that are growing, that have a lot of young people and fast population growth. So Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and to some degree, South, America, South and Central America uh, are the places with rapid Facebook growth. Fast, Facebook has largely flatlined in terms of growth in North America, in Western Europe, uh, and I'm pretty sure in Australia it's flatlined as well. So uh, nonetheless, look, Twitter has never been one of the top social media platforms. It's never been that important. Its importance has been outsized by, by virtue of uh, uh, it being sort of the platform of choice for elites. So a lot of celebrities and sports figures, certainly journalists, have been active on Twitter around the world. And so because that's the place to get journalists to notice you, or you post something on Facebook, chances are no journalist is ever going to see it. If you are an activist or a politician or a celebrity or just a person who wants to make fun of Elon Musk, like myself, uh, and you post something on Twitter, there's a chance a journalist is going to see it and amplify your message or somebody else is going to amplify your message in some way if you do something interesting or say something interesting or maybe even important. Uh, so Twitter's had that sort of outsized influence far beyond its actual media, its actual market penetration, uh, but its lack of growth, its tiny 
size of audience has kept it from making money and from growing into a real force in the world. So you can see like LinkedIn, the most boring of all social media platforms is significantly larger than Twitter and is, is actually more so now. Um, TikTok at 1.6 billion, that's probably a low number. I would guess that TikTok is closer to 2 billion now. That's 1.6 billion. I'd say it's closer to 2 billion people now. Uh, WeChat also creeping up on about 1.5 billion. This is, I think, a bit of a low number. Um, uh, remains to see what kind of growth TikTok and WeChat can have in the near future. But that's the story to watch, I think. Those two platforms are going to have the most interesting changes in our global media ecosystem over the next decade or so. But look at these numbers for Instagram, WhatsApp, YouTube, and Facebook. Right? YouTube is owned by Alphabet. Meta owns Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. Those are hard to dislodge from positions of power. So this is why I chose to write a book about Facebook and not some other company or, or platform, right? Because it's where all the action is in the world. And I think we need to keep that in perspective. So I'm giving you all this information as a way of saying that we read and hear a lot about Musk and all the ways he's messing around with Twitter, and it just doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter in the long run. Musk's ownership of Twitter, I think, is unfortunate for those of us who have enjoyed and benefited from Twitter over the past decade or so. Twitter has been a remarkable place for conversation, often about serious issues, sometimes even in a serious way, right? It has been a remarkable platform for connecting people interested in movements like Black Lives Matter in the United States. It's been a remarkable platform for having other activists find each other around the world. It's certainly been an, a remarkable platform for people to generate attention from mainstream media. So it's had an effect in the world, and that effect is no longer going to be with us. But I'm, I, I, I really think we often overestimate that effect. So I actually want us to think less about what Musk has done with Twitter and more about what he's done with other companies. And look, I, don't, I, I would be willing to bet that Twitter won't be around in 12 months. Musk borrowed most of that $44 billion to buy Twitter. Sure, he's the world's wealthiest person, but wealth and money are not the same thing. And I, this is widely misunderstood. Being the world's wealthiest person does not mean he has money to spend. I mean, he has money to spend because he takes enough, right? He has, you know, garages full of Teslas and Lotuses and other cars and eight children with three or four different women and lots of, you know, he spends money, but he doesn't have $44 billion lying around to buy a company. He actually doesn't have millions of dollars at any given point to buy much of anything besides cars, houses, alimony, and child support, right? Those are, that's, that's one of the big myths about the super wealthy is that they have money at their disposal. The reason that Musk has a high number attached to his name is that he owns Tesla stock. And the only way that he could convert that into money is to sell all that Tesla stock, which would then drop the value of Tesla stock and in many ways wipe out his on paper wealth. So there's a paradox there about how you might actually liquidate your on paper wealth if you're super rich. I'm not asking you to feel bad for rich people, especially billionaires, but it's a fact that if you want to do something big, like buy a company, a, a, the world's wealthiest person still has to borrow money from banks, from venture capital firms, and from the Saudi royal family, which is where he got a lot of the money to buy Twitter. So if you want to think about the geopolitical fallout of his purchase of Twitter, pay attention to that. What does it mean that he is in, he's basically been captured by the Saudi royal family, and how will that and his need to pay back that money affect the decisions he makes, not only with Twitter, but with his other companies around the world? I don't know, but you can tell I'm worried. Now, SpaceX, as I said, is actually his most interesting company and his most successful company in terms of actually making money. 
So he's making money, as I said, because of contracts with governments, some companies, mostly the US government. It's also, I think, our biggest concern. SpaceX is a rocket company fundamentally. He has created a fleet of, of, of rockets that his engineers have designed and his factories have built, and he leases them to companies and governments whenever they want to send a satellite up. Whenever the United States wants to send astronauts up now, astronauts don't fly on publicly funded NASA rockets anymore. Astronauts fly up on SpaceX rockets. And Elon Musk makes money every time that happens. Now, what I would like us to pay attention to, though, is Starlink, which is a subsidiary of SpaceX. Starlink was kind of an afterthought to his dream, right? Musk has always wanted to colonize Mars, among other things. So it's like a boyhood dream of his. So he started this company with some of his PayPal money, again, to, um, to envision creating affordable space travel that would ultimately drop accessibility and price point to the point where we might think about living on other planets. I guess that justifies the destruction of this planet. I don't know. I don't know exactly how he's thinking about all this. Nonetheless, when you have that much money, and, or at least that much wealth, not money, and that much ego, it's the sort of thing you imagine doing. Well, along the way, he also figured out that he could launch a series of low orbit satellites that could provide fairly dependable and consistent and high speed internet service to areas of the world that lack it. Like about a third of Australia, about a third of the United States, about two thirds of Canada, a significant part of Russia if they wanted it, right? Areas that are largely rural, sparsely populated, that it's, it doesn't make sense for a private company to run physical wires out to these places. Uh, and our current terrestrial system of, uh, of uh, 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 internet connectivity uh, is still a little bit too expensive in a lot of areas to, to justify. So, um, and the bandwidth is just not there, right? So he has come up with, or his company has come up with, um, a set of technologies, again, all funded by government money, uh, to create a constellation of satellites around the world. There's about, at this point, actually 2,500 mass-produced satellites in low orbit. They're not in geosynchronous orbit. They're, con they're constantly moving around the Earth in their own orbit, and they talk to each other, right? It, it's it very much networked like the internet itself, where Packets fly satellite to satellite and then back down to, uh, to um, stations on the Earth uh, that are not too big. You'll see it in a moment. Um, these terminals, uh, which are you know, used and leased by people around the world, are dropping in price as well. There's a whole marketing wing. If you go to the uh, Starlink website, you'll see a whole marketing wing trying to sell these to people who have uh, caravans, for instance, or boats. So if you take a boat or a small ship out into the ocean, you can have pretty durable connectivity if you have a Starlink unit uh, on there. And that uh, uh, the company sees as a major growth opportunity. Now, um, the story of how Starlink worked in Ukraine is fascinating, though. So, Ukraine had, for a long time, a fairly durable and fairly well-established internet system with multiple providers. Uh, the population of Ukraine, of course, often speaks two languages um, and would use, in many cases, Russian services over its local domestic internet service providers, Russian services for search engines and social media. Um, it just made sense. Alphabets worked better, right? The Cyrillic like alphabet worked better on those systems. Uh, many people had connections on both sides of the border. Uh, many people spoke both languages. So uh, the sense of what the Ukrainian internet felt like for many decades was hybrid. But 
still Ukrainian, right? Still largely controlled by Ukraine. Uh, of course, it was often affected by Russian propaganda, uh, but not necessarily disrupted until the war, right? Until the invasion. Uh, and, and after the invasion, uh, the infrastructure remained for some months, largely because Russia was fairly convinced it was going to take over the country fast and didn't want to destroy much of the inherent infrastructure. It wanted to take it over. You know, Russia figured it would march in there and everybody in Ukraine would just go, yeah, whatever, I guess this is, this is how we're living now. Um, uh, that seems to be Putin's attitude about everybody in the world. Uh, and so he, of course, was uh, uh, rudely dismissed uh, by the people of Ukraine, uh, and uh, he found out it's not going to be so easy, uh, and set about destroying infrastructure. Uh, at, at that point, and somewhat earlier, it became really clear to the Ukrainian government and the military that they were going to need uh, a resilient system of communication for both civilian and military um, needs. Uh, and so uh, members of the government in Ukraine contacted Elon Musk directly, actually through Twitter, and got his attention. Uh, and he started a series of conversations with the government of Ukraine, but also with the government of the United States uh, to provide terminals uh, to Ukraine um, for what he assumed would be largely civilian use. I don't know why he assumed that. This was a government under pressure uh, at war. Uh, but uh, apparently he didn't foresee it, the, his systems being used for aggressive military action, uh, even though Russia had occupied significant portions of Ukraine in the previous years. And Ukraine, of course, had an interest in taking back that territory, not to mention the territory it lost in the first few months of the invasion. Uh, so um, this is a, just a bizarre, fascinating story here. Here we have one person who runs a privately held company who has basically no accountability, right? Nobody can tell him what to do. Nobody can dictate to Elon Musk what the policies and procedures of Starlink should be. And what he's providing and, and did at his own cost for some time was so essential to daily life in Ukraine and deeply essential to the military resistance in Ukraine. Because Starlink was not something that Russia could control or destroy. It was distributed, right? It was distributed so much you had to knock out every Starlink uh, terminal, every one of these little dishes if you wanted to destroy it. So this was a problem for Putin. Putin really wanted to control the infrastructure, and if he couldn't control it, destroy the infrastructure. Starlink, make sure he can't. And yet, Musk and Putin appear to be close. Musk has uh, on several occasions tweeted about his conversations with Putin. Now, Musk lies more than he tells the truth, so it's difficult to say that he's really talking to Putin or how often he's talking to Putin if he is. Uh, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that he and Putin have had a few conversations. He's probably had conversations with other people in the Russian government. And, and I'm sure that whether it's Putin or somebody else in the Russian government, they have complained about the fact that Musk's company is being used by Ukraine and used by the military. So we don't really know what particular actions the company has taken in response to this complaint, but we should be worried. So we know that Musk has also been in constant conversation with people in the military and government of Ukraine and in constant conversation with people in the military of the United States. And probably directly with the White House, because there's so much concern about this. Now, I'm sure he loves every one of these connections, right? He has a bit of an authoritarian personality. He's certainly an egomaniac. I'm sure he loves the adoration and attention from Vladimir Putin, not unlike other egomaniacs we've known who have found themselves enamored with Vladimir Putin. But he also probably really loves the fact that the most powerful military in the history of the world is bowing to him as well, right? He probably loves that he can play both of these sides and get all of that attention. 
Now, uh, as I said, Starlink was basically footing the bill for most of this effort in Ukraine for many, many months until Musk complained about it and said, look, we can't keep doing this. And I have to say that's not an unreasonable position for the leader of a company to take, right? That's not a crazy thing to say. I'm supplying something at a cost of many millions of dollars per month, and that can't go on as long as this war might seem to be going on, which, you know, it could be many years. To do it on Twitter, well, that's another thing, right? But at that moment, of course, the U.S. military scrambled. They were very worried that Musk was just going to shut off the service and the military in Ukraine would not be able to do, you know, on in the field communications if he just flipped a switch. In addition, as the Ukrainian military started encroaching on territory that the Russian military had captured, it was pretty clear that the geofencing that Musk had built or that Starlink had built into this system would mean that the units would only work in territory that Starlink defined as Ukraine and not territory that Starlink defined as Russia. And also, it was pretty clear that Starlink was going on with whatever Putin said was Russia. So as troops would cross over what had been a border and push the border farther, their communications ceased. And this caused tremendous panic, understandably. In Kiev, in Washington, in Brussels, in London, it was a really bad situation. And we're just starting to find out the extent of this. But a lot of people, including... Professor Wojciech, who've been following this for some time, have known this is a problem for a while. Uh, American journalists are just catching up to the fact that this has been a problem. Uh, in June of 2023, just a few months ago, the US military finally negotiated a contract with Starlink that assures some level of service for some amount of money, but this contract is not public. So I don't know how much of my money is going to Starlink for this. Uh, I don't know what the terms of the agreement are. Nobody knows, it seems, whether we can, and more importantly, the people of Ukraine, can count on this service continuing and being as valuable as it has been over the past. We do know that there were times earlier in the conflict when military forces attached Starlink terminals to drones so they could actually fly the service into other areas and do whatever else they wanted to do with drones. Pretty fascinating hacking of technology in a wartime situation. Uh, once Starlink found out that they were doing this, Starlink declared this a violation of their terms of service, an unauthorized use, uh, and they have blocked that ability in some way. But again, it's unclear from everything I've looked at just how they did that, but they did manage to do that. So. Um, so at this point, Ukraine can't attach these things to drones and have them work. Um, a spokesperson for Starlink said, we know the military is using them for comms communication, and that's OK. But our intent was never to have them use it for offensive purposes. But what is offensive in a defensive war, right? <laughs> so. Again, you have to worry about what is being defined as offense and defense, what is being defined as Russia, and what is being defined as Ukraine. By a, a company owned by a person, run by a person, who has deep affection and respect for Vladimir Putin and uh, a lot of reason to um, indulge Vladimir Putin. But let's go beyond Russia and Ukraine. Let's go to all the areas of the world where Starlink is either proliferating or soon to proliferate. Starlink is the leading mover, the first mover in this market for low altitude satellites that provide fairly affordable and accessible internet connections. When I say affordable, it's not affordable to a lot of people in Tanzania right now, but maybe in 20 years it will be, maybe in 10 years it will be. Right now it's, it's affordable if you're the sort of American who can afford a boat, you can probably afford Starlink on top of it. Uh, that's about how affordable it is, right? How about 150 a month to, uh, once you've paid the upfront cost for the unit, about 150 a month for the service, 150 US dollars per month 
for the service. So again, not affordable to most of the world, but the price is going to drop as the units become cheaper to produce and the network effect takes, takes hold. You can imagine a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of states around the world wanting to invest in this technology as well. You can imagine insurgent groups wanting to invest in this technology as well. Right? Imagine an insurgent military group in a place like Mali investing in this to have durable communication as well. That's an interesting phenomenon, you know, or, or Yemen, right? That's an interesting phenomenon. So look, Starlink is going to face all sorts of other geopolitical complications going forward. How are they going to structure their service? What are they going to allow and disallow? Who are they going to do business with? These are going to be fascinating questions going forward. They've just started. But let's also remember, because it's an early mover in this, it's going to be very hard for other companies to get in on it. There's, there are limited lanes in the sky for these satellites. Jeff Bezos, who for a while was the wealthiest person in the world, the founder and largest shareholder in Amazon, has wanted to create a competing service, has the technology, has the units, just can't get the sort of government contracts that SpaceX has but also just hasn't been able to move fast enough to really compete with Musk on this effort. So it's weird that we have to cheer for Jeff Bezos to compete with Elon Musk and not leave Elon Musk as the only factor in this. There are other companies that would love to get in on this too, but again, there's limited space. So we have this weird tragedy of the commons, right? Nobody owns that strata of the stratosphere. Right? But because nobody owns it, anybody can fill it with metal, which is exactly what Musk has done. Filled it with his own metal, leaving no room, or very little room, for anybody else. But as I said, like, look toward the near future when lots of weird political forces and military forces around the world start deploying these technologies. Now, what does it matter that it's a privately held corporation? I want to make the argument that it matters a lot, right? So I, I want you to take a moment and, under, and try to understand a little bit the makeup of corporate governance. One of the least sexy topics you can ever imagine studying, but I'm, I, I'm here to convince you it's important. A publicly held corporation is one in which the ownership is distributed on a market. And anybody with the money to buy a share may buy a share. And most of us who have pensions do buy those shares, whether we know it or not. Pensions or retirement investment funds, right? University endowments, these are all put into these publicly traded companies. So you own part of it. If you have a pension fund, if you have a, uh, a retirement fund, then you do probably own some of Tesla, some of Apple, some of Microsoft, some of any number of other publicly traded companies. Now what that matters, what that means is the governance of that company, the, the decision of who runs that company is up to the board of directors and the board of directors happen to be shareholders as well. They are elected by the shareholders at large. Let's not pretend it's some great democratic experience, right? They, it's often the same group of people shuffling through and most shareholders aren't paying attention to what's going on with the companies they own. So they don't actually voice their opinions or vote. And the CEO and top management that were selected by that board are usually the same cast of characters, recycled, right, across the world. Doesn't matter how many convictions or lawsuits for sexual harassment they get, they keep getting jobs. So again, let's not pretend it's an ideal situation, but there is some measure of accountability. There are cultures of activist investors who can aim to discipline a company if a company seems to be going off the rails. If Twitter were still a publicly traded company right now, Elon Musk could not do what he's doing. He would have been pushed out, right? He would have, his top management would have been pushed out at this point. Activist investors would have moved to make changes in the company and limit what he's trying to do to the company to undermine its ability to make revenue. But it's not, he took it private as soon as he bought it. He bought enough of the stock to make it private and then paid off the investors. So being private means he calls all the shots. And again, of those companies he owns, only Tesla is public. 
one of the reasons that Tesla isn't as bad a company as it used to be and is actually doing fairly well is that it's publicly traded, that he has to answer to other shareholders, including institutional shareholders that have a lot of power. State pension funds, the pension fund of the teachers of California is one of the biggest investors in the world in most companies. And if they own some of Tesla stock, and I'm sure they do, then they're sitting at those board meetings and making sure that there's some discipline in the company and things don't go totally off the rails for that company. Now that can matter sometimes. There are activist investors who are concerned about climate change. There are activist investors who are concerned about uh, the rise of authoritarianism and racism and violence around the world. And they are willing to have companies make decisions that take those values seriously. They're not dominant or prominent, but they exist. And teachers' pension funds are among them, right? So again, there's some level of accountability, some ability to curb excess. SpaceX has nothing like that. Again, Musk makes all the calls. If SpaceX and Musk starts making decisions that are not in the best interest of the company or the United States or human beings in general, nobody's there to whisper in his ear, hey, maybe you've gone too far. Maybe this isn't the right move, right? Except his lawyers who he tends not to listen to. Now, again, I don't want to glorify publicly owned companies. It's not that much better than a privately owned company, but it's a little bit better. And I would argue it would make a huge difference in the case of SpaceX. There are other forms of corporate management. There are B corporations that are uh, expressly and sort of almost constitutionally committed to uh, uh, fighting climate change and uh, environmental degradation and, and labor abuse and so forth. This is not one of them. Musk is not interested in these sorts of companies. They do exist. And of course, there are publicly held corporations that we tend to think of as utilities. Universities are one of them. This university is actually a corporation uh, owned by the public. Um, and you can imagine, for instance, had in a different world where people actually thought about the fact that we might want this service in the world, 25, 30 years ago, different governments could have actually created a publicly funded and government governed and accountable system of high-speed satellite internet producers. Now, again, the media ownership system is uh, debate is something worth considering here. Um, look, media ownership is a classic concern that is often about a limited number of people owning all the important channels of discourse and channels of information distribution. It's a tired and familiar argument. It's not an irrelevant argument even today, because despite the proliferation of what you might call channels through our digital environment, uh, we still get most of our news and information through traditional channels like television and radio and newspapers, even if we see them secondhand on our phones. They originate with those places, which is why Rupert Murdoch still matters on three different continents. But when we look at media concentration, we're often looking at content in vertical integration, right? The network's owned by a person who is also producing the content, which might have a political slant or a limited view of the world, and that's going to affect democracy and probably other things like commerce. But the question of Musk and media ownership is so much more interesting and crucial because of his early move to control that layer of communication infrastructure, which I'm willing to argue is going to be that much more important, incredibly important over the next decade or two. So Musk's ownership of those satellites will mean, I think, much more than Rupert Murdoch's ownership of any television network station or newspaper ever has been. Uh, and I think we, we need to be deeply concerned about it. Let's also remember that the constellation of companies that Musk owns almost all depend on the People's Republic of China for something, some manufacturing, some trade, some licensing, some permission, which means that he has to make sure not to upset Xi either, right? He has to, he wants to make Putin happy. He has to make Xi happy. And this, this can affect all of his other businesses. Because if, if the government of the People's Republic of China decided to punish Elon Musk, it could shut down Tesla production tomorrow. Because so many essential parts of Tesla motors 
are produced in China, including, I think at this point, whole cars. All right, I promised to talk about digital sovereignty. I only have a few minutes to talk about it. What does it mean and why does Musk matter to this? Look, digital sovereignty is a complicated concept. It runs along different layers of the content, in other words, what we actually share and flow across these networks, including propaganda, the applications, whether you're using Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, YouTube, and the infrastructure, right? How we actually move the packets back and forth. So for a country to enforce its own digital sovereignty, to assert its own digital sovereignty, it has to pay attention to what's happening in all three of these layers. And it often uh, expresses this in terms of where the data is held, who owns it, who gets to control it, how it flows. Right? So we see this most prominently in Europe. Now, digital sovereignty is a sort of super uh, phenomenon above data sovereignty. But it's about the combination of data and technological regulation that either enhances or distinguishes a nation state from another nation state. And again, we see this at work in Ukraine in wartime, which is what Professor Boychek and I are currently writing about. The opposite of data sovereignty is data hegemony. And there are different models of data hegemony. Uh, we've been looking at, for instance, uh, the ways in which India and Israel manage data access in what you might call their occupied territories, certainly Gaza being the most obvious of those, but I would say Kashmir in India as well. Right? It's essentially an occupied territory where the government sees the population as hostile and is trying to geofence it and control internet access in some pretty excessive ways. So we've been looking at that, but mostly we've been looking at Russia, China, and the United States as dominant models of digital sovereignty. Uh, I'm sorry, digital hegemony. Now, China says that it's enforcing sovereignty when, in fact, it's both defending its own sovereignty as a countervailing force against U.S. global hegemony and the U.S. model of an open free flow of, of information. Um, but it's also, just as importantly, interested in its own hegemony, especially when it comes to Taiwan. Uh, so that's, that's something we're looking at. Uh, and again, the tools that we use, that we see used to express digital hegemony are propaganda, um, attacks like distributed uh, um, denial of service attacks, uh, internet kill switches that are built into infrastructure, um, massive surveillance systems, uh, censorship and blocking systems, and data protectionism like in Europe. And we see a lot of this enforced or created through trade treaties and agreements World Trade Organization, World Intellectual Property Organization, the Free Trade uh, Association of the Americas, uh, even the EU Treaty of Rome, all have implications for digital and data sovereignty and, he and hegemony. So uh, we're very interested in, in describing these models. Now, again, Musk plays an interesting role in this, but he's not the only one. Non-state actors are the other party, and this is what we want to pay a lot of attention to as we draw out our models of digital sovereignty and hegemony. So whether it's Meta or Alphabet or Microsoft, Huawei, Apple, Amazon, any number of other companies, they all play a role in resisting and enforcing digital sovereignty. Now, when we look around at the private actors around the world and how they do this, we don't see any clear theories or patterns emerging. We might over time. We haven't seen it yet. Some of these companies work with states to enforce sovereignty, some work against states to enhance hegemony from the outside, right? Some of them seem to be acting as agents of the United States, for instance, in some cases. Most of these companies will work both sides of that. Sometimes they'll be agents of hegemony, sometimes they'll be agents of sovereignty, depending on who's paying them the most or what they have, what they have to lose in a particular situation. So it's all tricky and complicated, especially in a market like India, which is the fast growing market that everybody wants to control. Right? It's, the, it's the place that so many of these companies see uh, their future dollars or rupees coming from. Uh, but China right now is the most complicated nation when it comes to how non-state actors deal with these questions of hegemony and sovereignty. Now, Musk and Starlink are exceptional and exceptionally challenging to deal with. And so I want to argue that we actually should be looking into creating international treaties and agreements to regulate that service, the low altitude satellite service.
that provides internet. We, we absolutely need major nations of the world to convene and try to figure out what the basic standards and values should be for this system of infrastructure and decide whether there should be this kind of concentration of power among one non-state actor or what we might do to alleviate that. Now, I have a bias toward the US free flow principles only because I haven't seen a better model that will serve the interests of democracy and, and the flourishing of humanity in any other way. And that's not to overstate it, right? I don't think that the US model for internet hegemony is the answer to the, uh, the flourishing of humanity by any means. I just look around the world and see a lot of other worse models. And that's frustrating to me. So I don't wanna leave you with a sense that there's nothing that can be done, but whatever has to be done to address this situation, we haven't even begun to imagine. And we might have to get stuck with the US model of hegemony ultimately dominating. And the worst case of that would be a nationalization of this system, right? Where the United States government actually takes over Elon Musk's business. I don't think that would be great for anybody, but we really do have to take it seriously and ask whether that would be at least slightly better than the situation of an irascible, unpredictable tech mogul determining whether soldiers and civilians, activists and governments are going to be able to use commu basic communication technologies over the next decade. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.